it's important that any trade union celebrates International Women's Day. For a union that's made up of over half women, which is what UCU is, it's incredibly important because they are the backbone of our union and they are the backbone of our activist structure. What we have to do in the trade union movement and in our union is each and every year make it clear through our support of International Women's Day that not only has the past been made up of strong women, but our future is going to be founded on the work that strong women in the trade union movement today undertake. So UCU will say very loudly, very clearly, International Women's Day is about trade union women, it's about UCU women celebrating and being made aware of how well they fit within the movement and how much the union movement owes to them. International Women's Day is a powerful symbol of the fight for equality. It is rooted in the struggle for rights in the workplace and the demand from women for a better deal. There remains many places where the lack of political and economic rights means women continue to be second-class citizens, while even here in the UK, to be female in the 21st century means you are likely to be paid less and have a higher chance of facing discrimination. International Women's Day was born from the activities of women in the labour movement at the turn of the 20th century in North America. It quickly spread to Europe. The match workers, of course, lived mostly in the East End of London. They worked at the Bryant and May factory and they were subject to appalling conditions. They were paid um, very badly, very badly indeed. But the significant thing about the match workers' strike, and by the way, it wasn't organised from the outside. It was the women themselves who organised it. These women were the wives, the sisters, well, related basically to dock workers because they lived cheek by jowl with dockers. And they were the inspiration for the dock worker strike of the year 1889. And, you know, people think that new unionism, which is basically unionism amongst the unskilled, was started by the dockers, but it wasn't. The, docker, the strike for the dockers' tanner, it, it was basically these women that inspired dockers. And, you know, I think that's a very important historical correction to make. More than half the population of New York City in the early 1900s were mostly Jewish and Italian immigrants. Men, women and children worked for low pay in the many garment factories in appalling working conditions. Productivity and profit were the order of the day. Employers had very little regard to the health and safety of their employees. They would be fined for being late or for damaging a garment. Clara Lemlich came from a New York Jewish family. She was also a worker in the garment shop run by the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. At a union meeting in 1909, Clara made the first call for strike action in Yiddish. This would become the largest strike of women in history. If I turn traitor to the cause I now pledge, may this hand wither from the arm I now raise. On November 24, 1909, 15,000 shirtwaist workers walked out of the factories, with more joining the strike the following day, bringing the total walkout to 20,000. The strike galvanised women to take action, and between 1909 and 1915, a wave of strike action was taken in New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Chicago, Iowa and Michigan. In February 1910, over 300 factory firms conceded to the women's demands for union recognition. The Triangle Shirtwaist Company rejected every union demand. A year later, a fire broke out on their premises, killing 146 female employees. The survivor, Rose Saffron, said, If the union had won, we'd have been safe. Two of our demands were adequate fire escapes and open doors. We didn't get open doors or better fire escapes, so now our friends are dead. Encouraged by Clara Lemlich and the National Women's Trade Union League of America, Clara Zetkin proposed in 1910 to hold an annual Women's Day. In agreement with the class-conscious, political and trade union organisations of the proletariat of their respective countries, the socialist women of all countries will hold each year a Women's Day, whose foremost purpose must be to aid the attainment of women's suffrage 
This demand must be handled in conjunction with the entire woman's question according to socialist precepts. The Women's Day must have an international character and is to be prepared carefully. Alongside Clara Zetkin, Rosa Luxemburg ensured that the issue of women's equality was a central part of progressive politics. The conference decided that the demands for the day of struggle should be the struggle for women's suffrage, the fight against the threat of war, the fight for care for mother and child, and the fight against price rises. The first International Women's Day was held on the 19th of March 1911. In 1913, International Women's Day was transferred to the 8th of March. UCU has made this film for its National Women's Day for a number of reasons. First of all, because we are an education trade union. We are strongly committed to advancing equal opportunities for women and girls in adult, further and higher education. Since the days in the 19th century when women had to struggle for admission to universities, in some countries, women have made great progress in respect of educational equality. There are still, however, continuing inequalities. There is underrepresentation of women in some subject areas and in postgraduate study. Moreover, there are still parts of the world where it is a struggle for women and girls to access any education. The case of Malala Yousafzai, who was shot in 2012, shows how in some countries there are those who oppose education for women and girls. 75% of illiterate people in the world today are female. Two-thirds of the children who do not receive primary education are female. Many young women are removed from education for work or early marriage. The education of women and girls is a benefit both to individuals and to society. An educated woman has more choices in her life. While women in some parts of the world make considerable progress towards equality, in terms of education, employment and public office holding, there are still inequalities. Some people think that because women have the vote and because we have equality laws, the problem of gender equality has been sorted. It is not. We think International Women's Day is important. It is an opportunity to show our solidarity with women worldwide who are facing discrimination and oppression. It is an opportunity to celebrate achievements of women's rights. And it is an opportunity to commit ourselves to the continuing struggle for gender equality and women's liberation. The women's movement, such as it was, throughout the 19th century and the 20th century was very class divided. Um, the term suffragette um, was a term applied to the movement for votes for women by the Daily Mail. It was a diminutive term, suffragette, ladette, you know, that sort of thing. Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst, that is, um, Emmeline was Sylvia's mother and Christabel, her older sister, actively wanted to exclude working class women and only wanted to march alongside the important women of the world. Um, Sylvia took a completely different position. Not that Sylvia came from a different class, but she orientated all her campaigning um, towards working class women. In fact, she set up um, the East London Federation of Suffragettes, which was specifically designed to organise working class women in the East End. And she's unique in that respect. She was arrested as many times as her mother and sister were. And when you were arrested in those days, you were forcibly fed. And forcible feeding was not pleasant, to say the least. Well, Sylvia campaigned against the war. She had, uh, her paper was called The Women's Dreadnought, and then uh, it was The Workers' Dreadnought. And um, it was a terrific paper. I mean, I've read almost every issue, and I just, exciting. Women over 30 got the vote in 1918, um, but it wasn't a reward for war, war work. It's a complete myth. But not all, and, and all women got the vote uh, 10 years later, 1928. The scale of girls' education was highlighted following the School Inquiry Commission in 1864 that recorded only 12 public secondary schools for girls in England and Wales. For working class girls, education, and in particular, secondary education, was largely unavailable. Feminists such as Emily Davies, Barbara Lee Smith-Bodikin, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson and Millicent Garrett Fawcett 
of which the Forster Society is named after, were part of a group of women activists who campaigned for the rights of girls to have the same education opportunities as boys. Women would continue to attend university courses. While it did not amount to them leaving with a degree, this changed in 1878, when the University of London became the first university in the UK to accept women students on equal terms as men. Women made a late entry into education because, um, or at least working class women did, middle class women got there because they organised and in the 19th century um, they campaigned, I'm talking about middle class women, to open up education for middle class women. So you've got um, women grammar schools, you've got nursing profession for example, Florence Nightingale. Uh, Mary Seacole did some, but there were not many black nurses then at that time. Um, and um, working class women were not included at all, at all until 1890 when um, elementary education became free and compulsory. And then you did see uh, working class women going to school. That's if they could afford shoes, <laughs> and mostly they couldn't. Um, and during the First World War, women were recruited uh, into lots of different um, occupations because in 1916 there was conscription, so the men had to go and be soldiers whether they liked it or not. So the women went into factories, and they were already in factories, but they were largely unorganised, except for the workers' union, which organised uh, women, uh, did organise women, and had women full-time officials, very unusual, and the National Federation of Women Workers, which is a terrific organisation, really. The most awful thing took place, which was that, of course, it was awful that men were being killed just, you know, for example, on the Battle of, Battle of the Somme, it was hundreds of thousands of, of men were killed. On the home front, as it's stupidly called, and it was hardly homely, um, the women in the factories were paid a really, really appalling rates of pay. This was known as dilution. <laughs> it's, it's a terrible euphemism for paying women unequal wages. Um, they were doing the same jobs as men, but um, in fact, if you looked around, they were doing the same jobs everywhere. As engineers, as they worked in coal, they worked in, they, they, ran, they um, drove the buses, they drove trains, they do everything, but at lesser rates of pay. And the only unions that were interested of course, were the National Federation of Women Workers and the Workers' Union. The Amalgamated Society of Engineers did, to some extent, think that women should be organised, but they gave them a blue card, which basically meant they weren't full members. In 1968, women sewing machinists at the Ford car plant in Dagenham staged a strike calling for equal pay. This was a landmark victory in UK labour relations and became the trigger that caused the passing of the Equal Pay Act in 1970. Women have made some progress, but not massively. And I think unless and until women are properly organised in self-organised groups, just like Black members have to be organised in self-organised groups. We're not going to make the breakthrough we need. The rights of women need to be fought for by women, for women. We understand the problems between us that men may not experience, such as violence and hate crime, uh, parental leave, maternity leave, carers leave. The solidarity of women members in the union, one voice, is often lost. Collectively, we can be heard, we are heard, and we can make change. Women's membership of trade unions is significantly increasing faster than men over the years. We're finding it a great place to progress issues at work 
over flexible working, uh, childcare provisions, equal pay matters, which is a very, very strong uh, campaign that's going on now for God knows how many years, and we're still battling away at it um, in terms of promotion of women um, and uh, the location, uh, research on location of um, the prof professoriate, how many women are in there, how many black members are in there, and so on. So, trade unions are a, a great force for uh, positive social change, and I'm very pleased to see that membership of trade unions and leadership within trade unions is becoming more and more uh, taken up by women. I think the women's movement has done a lot to recognise diversity among women. It doesn't mean the women's movement always gets it right, uh, but women of colour, for instance, have challenged the women's movement to say, well, when you're talking about equality with men, which men are you talking about? Uh, you know, there are those issues. Um, disabled women have challenged the movement to say, look, what about our issues of access, our, our rights to participate in the movement? So when we're looking at a women's rights agenda, it is about recognising, too, that our women members are in a great variety of situations, both in terms of employment and domestic situation, and that many of them may be dealing not only with gender oppression, but also with other forms of discrimination and oppression, and they need a union which helps them to fight back on all fronts. The year-long strike in 1977, led by Jay Bindasai, challenged the image of Asian women as being passive. The strike showed the determination of an ignored group of women to make their voices heard. What you're running here is not a factory, it is a zoo. In a zoo there are many types of animals. Some are monkeys who dance on your fingertips, others are lions who can bite your head off. We are those lions, Mr Manager. Our theme this year for the Women's Conference as part of the Equality Conference was Women Against Oppression. Um, we need to consider issues for black women, for disabled women, for lesbians in the workplace. And that is really, really important that you may not necessarily just be discriminated against because you're a woman, but it may also be because you're disabled or because you're black or because you're a lesbian. The uh, high proportion of black members that find themselves in capabilities in disciplinaries, um, in, you know, heading up redundancy lists, um, and also, you know, in, in, in the bullying and harassment that actually takes place in the workplace where black members are actually sometimes just too afraid to enact any sort of uh, complaint procedure, um, too afraid of losing their jobs, too afraid of reprisals, thinking that, you know, if they keep their heads down, maybe they can get through. Um, and all, of course, really, really needing strong union support. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, being part of the BMSC, I'm part of that solution where people can feel that they are supported by the union. The main challenges I think uh, for sort of L, B and T women are going to be being out in the workplaces. I mean particularly if you are a lecturer I think um, you have a very public um, position, a very public face. I mean I've known quite a number of uh, L, B and T staff and not all of them are out. In fact probably a a minority uh, are out um, because you you can you know suffer harassment there can be difficulties um, not so much from parents you know because our students tend to be so much older than school students but there are still those issues comments that may be made behind people's backs you know um, inappropriate questions in classes that make staff members feel uh, uncomfortable and feel harassed um, you know there are there are a range of difficulties in terms of coming out and having that uh, confidence really to um, you know to operate as it were openly in the classroom. I mean I think casualization is in some ways a gender equality issue because I've often noticed stereotypes towards women workers um, on temporary contracts uh, particularly if they're working as highly paid lecturers and they have a misfortune to be married to a lecturer a male lecturer working in the same establishment there's the assumption that they're a married woman working for pin money and there's also an assumption they can't go anywhere else, they're not geographically mobile, and therefore there's no need to consider them seriously when a permanent job comes up. They're just assumed to be available. Like a lot of other um, protected characteristics, disadvantaged groups, um, LGBT people have often some serious issues about um, discrimination and harassment in 
colleges and universities. And the union has a structure of um, equality reps and branch officers and so on who can be people who are port of call really for somebody who has problems and you, you won't get that obviously if, if, if you're not a member of, um, of, of the UCU. I wanted to stress how women can be active, active as branch reps by getting involved in helping members in the workplace sort out their problems. Women who are on casual contracts, associate lecturers, those sort of jobs, who may have various concerns about their terms and conditions of service, their contracts, and these are areas that we can help support other women in. And I really do encourage women to come forward and volunteer and get involved and join with the rest of us in becoming uh, campaigning and organising for a better workplace and a better life for women. University unions are stronger if they bring in the skills and abilities of all their members and are inclusive. You know, diversity can be a strength, so that's important. I think women have a right to be active in the unions, just like they have a right to be active in the workplace or the right to have a place in any part of public life. I do think unions have been an area where there's been a fantastic transformation. I mean, if we go back to the days when unions supported policies like the family wage, which undermined really the principle of equal pay, or saw women as just temporary people in the workplace, to one now where unions are strongly supporters of women's rights, I think it's been really important that they have made a significant contribution to gender equality. So I actually think working in, in the unions is a very good way to promote gender equality in society. It's incredibly important for women within the trade union movement to take on activist roles. By that, I don't just mean the training officer role, the equality officer role. What I mean is actually to say that they can be the lead negotiator, they can be the branch secretary, they can be the branch president, they can be the chair of their region and they should, I think, stand for the NEC and actually I think it would be very good if a lot more women said I want to be the general secretary of my union. When I decided to be the uh, general secretary of what was originally a UT for me, I did it with the support of a lot of active women within AUT. I wouldn't have been able to do it without that and I think it's important for me to say now that unless they had come to me and talked to me about it, I don't think I'd have had the courage to actually say I'm, I'm good enough to do it because women don't tend to do that in the same way that men do. My experience in the job, and this is something I want to say to any woman out there, is they can do it and they can be a brilliant general secretary in the same way that they can be a brilliant branch chair. So whilst I know within our union, we, comparative to other unions, can say we've got a lot more women in active roles. I know that we've got the same problem that other unions have, which is that we tend to be in silos. We are facing very, very tough times. It's so important that everybody, and particularly young workers, do join trade unions. Then we can be together, we can support each other through difficult times. So this is the General Secretary of UCU speaking to every woman out there. If you want to be the person who leads on the negotiations for the people that you represent in your branch, you go out and do it because you're as good as any man and you should actually be out there and your voice should be heard. Not just as a woman, but as the voice of UCU, of all of the members that we represent, and make sure that that woman's voice is seen as central, both in the branch, at region, and at national. And I look forward to working with you. With all the roles that women play in everyday life, a woman's place is in the union. There is no tool for development more effective than the empowerment of women.